Grief. We dread it. And we can't avoid it. As I put this lesson together, I realize this is something I really can't speak from experience on. But I know something. If I live longer than Moy, I will experience it. So I really have no idea what it is like to lose a wife or a husband. But C.S. Lewis wrote shortly after the death of his wife a few things in a journal and put it in a book and called it A Grief Observed. And he made this observation about in the very early stages of his grief over the loss of his wife. It is hard to have patience with people who say there is no death or death doesn't matter. There is death and whatever is matters and whatever happens has consequences and it and they are irrevocable and irreversible. You might as well say that birth doesn't matter. I look up at the night sky. Is anything more certain than that in all those vast times and spaces, if I were allowed to search them, I should nowhere find her face, her voice, her touch. She died. She is dead. Is the word so difficult to learn? I have no photograph of her that's any good. I cannot even see her face distinctly in my imagination. Yet the odd face of some stranger seen in a crowd this morning may come before me in vivid perfection the moment I close my eyes tonight. No doubt the explanation is simple enough. We have seen the faces of those we know best so variously from so many angles and so many expressions, waking, sleeping, laughing, crying, eating, talking, thinking, that all the impressions crowd into our memory together and cancel out into a mere blur. But her voice is still vivid. That remembered voice that can turn me at any moment to a whimpering child. I can't imagine it, but a lifelong partner, gone. And I think Ruth shows us how to overcome such devastating grief. Ruth is a love story, and that's the way we tend to think of it. But Ruth is more than a love story. Ruth is a series of contrasts between two widows, Ruth and Naomi and between Boaz and the men of Israel. It's interesting where Ruth is placed in the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, the story of Ruth is placed immediately after Proverbs 31, and the story of the worthy woman, or the description of the worthy woman. And certainly Ruth is an example of a worthy woman. Interestingly enough, in the Protestant canon, Ruth appears after the book of Judges as a surprising story of righteous people who followed God. It's surprising because the book was probably written during the time that Israel was in exile, or Judah was in exile, and there were a lot of things that those people needed to consider. One. His apostasy with Israel began in the days of the judges, and it was a dark time. And they needed some stories of hope. But this story was a bit of a surprise, because in the midst of so much darkness, here's Ruth, and here is Boaz. So what I'd like to do this evening, because I'd like to work from the story, is for us to read the story of Ruth together, and then we'll look at how Ruth overcame widowhood. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife 
and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, which means God is my king. And the name of his wife, Naomi, which means pleasant or joy. And the names of his two sons were Malon, sickly, and Kilion, which means annihilation. I don't think those names are an accident. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. That's the word for bitter. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And he, she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the, of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman, woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, 
She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land, and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and, with, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness is not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, Observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came <laughs> softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, 
you have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. <clears throat> now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Epaphratha and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then Naomi said, the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, is, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, 
the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. It's a great story. But how did Ruth overcome widowhood? Well, Ruth overcame by choosing God and his people. Let's go back to chapter 1, Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. When Naomi tried to send her away, send Ruth away, Ruth refused. In fact, Naomi, in her bitterness, and I think that's something that sometimes we overlook, is that Naomi was bitter. And in her bitterness, she tells Ruth, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. And notice what she's telling her. Return after your sister-in-law. She's telling her to go back to an island. Now, Naomi's bitter, and obviously Naomi's had a great loss. But remember, Elimelech and Naomi left Israel to go to Moab when there was a famine in Israel, which means that they actually went and put themselves under the protection of Chemosh, the idol of Moab. And now she's coming back because she's heard things are good in Israel. And you also notice that she feels like she's been attacked by God, maybe even punished by God for what's happened. And so it's pretty significant that she's telling Naomi, telling Ruth to go to back to her God. But Ruth is different. Ruth is determined to make a lifetime commitment to God and his people. Notice her response. To Naomi. Naomi's pushing her away and she says, don't urge me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people and your God my God. Remember what God said to Israel? I will be your God and you shall be my people. Ruth says to Naomi, you sh your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. It's flipped. And no Israelite would expect a Moabite to make the commitment that every Israelite should have made. <laughs> she is so committed to her decision that she makes a vow. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth has made an outstanding commitment. Notice what she's saying. She is committing to provide her mother-in-law's care. She is committing to live among her mother-in-law's people. And she is committing to God. And I think the significance of this is that she does it despite Naomi's attitude. The bitterness is pointed out twice here in chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 13, she says, For it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the Lord, hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And when she comes back to Bethlehem, and, and I think... <coughs> We need to realize things were really rough on Naomi. Because when she comes back to Bethlehem, they look at her, and the question is, is this Naomi? Like, maybe Naomi doesn't look like she did when she left. And with all the hardship she's had, I doubt that she does. But Naomi says, 
Don't call me Naomi. Literally, don't call me Joy. Call me Mar. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and came back, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me joy when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Folks, just short, this is just short of saying, I blame God for what happened to me. Isn't that sometimes the reaction that we have when a loved one dies? Ruth is placing her trust in God. But Ruth is also... And I think this is important to note. She's committing to a rather uncertain future. She's going to go live in Israel as a foreigner. Not only just, not just any foreigner, but a despised foreigner. And she will be a poor widow there. When I looked at this, I thought, wow, this is very similar to the decision that Moses made. You remember from Hebrews 11, verse 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Ruth is choosing to be mistreated among the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And so the first way that Ruth overcomes her own grief and her own widowhood is by choosing God and His people. But Ruth also overcame through dedicated service to Naomi. And this, part, this is really remarkable, as I've already kind of touched on. But Ruth served Naomi by gleaning in the fields of Israel. Now, there was a law in the Old Testament about that landowners were not to harvest right up to the corners of their land. They were to leave the corners so that the poor and the strangers, that would be foreigners, could glean from the fields. But remember, we're in the time of the judges and how good are people at listening to the law of God? During the time of the judges, the Israelites did not carefully follow God's law. And honestly, it was dangerous for a single foreign woman to go to the fields alone and glean. Some landowners, rather than let her do it, would chase her away. And it's interesting that in chapter 2 and verse 22, that Naomi warns her, about going to any other field other than Boaz because she might be assaulted. In our language, it might be she would be raped. But Ruth overcame her fears by providing food for her mother-in-law and herself. She did what she could. It's interesting that it, when Ruth goes to do this, we're introduced to Boaz. And Boaz's name is, means, in him is strength. In the ESV, he's called a worthy man. But in the other versions, he's called a man of great wealth, a man of standing, a prominent man of noble character. All those descriptions fit because there is a contrast between Boaz and the rest of the men in Israel. Boaz is a righteous and generous man. He is a man of God. Others might be chasing the poor out of their fields and not even letting them glean. And he's also mentioned that he's a relative of Elimelech and Naomi. But all of this is to say that God's providence is at work. Did you notice that when Ruth goes out to glean in chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. <clears throat> what I take that to mean is that God protects Ruth by directing her steps to work in the fields of Boaz. God protects Ruth from those who, as it says in the end of Judges, who did what was right in their own eyes. But why does God help Ruth? 
I think the answer is found in the way Boaz answers her when she says, why are you, why are you showing any favor to me? In chapter 2 and verse 11 we read, But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people you did not know before. But notice what Boaz says to her. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I love that last phrase. That the way Boaz sees it is that Ruth came to be under the wings of God, to be under his protection. And I think that's why God helps her. It's because he too sees the dedication to him and the dedication to serving Naomi. But Ruth also overcame by maintaining her personal integrity. Ruth's nationality is emphasized throughout this story. You notice how many times she's called Ruth the Moabite? It's five times, at least the way I counted it. Now, the Israelites' expectations of women, Moabite women, were pretty low. For example, where did the Moabites come from? Well, we know from Genesis 19 that Moabite, the Moabite people originated from Lot's daughters and the incestuous relationship they had with their father when they got him drunk. They tricked him. Got him, got him drunk, got pregnant, and one of the daughters bore the, the, the original descendant of Moab. But in Numbers 25, when the last of the old generation died out from wandering in the wilderness and they're on their way, the Israelites are on their way to take the promised land, it's the Moabite women who were involved in the enticement of Israel to worship Baal. Between that and the fact that they wouldn't help Israel when they were trying to go around to the east side of the Jordan, God said no Moabite can be in the tabernacle or the temple worship for ten generations after they convert. So think about that. So there was no expectation that a Moabite woman was going to act well. And the story seems to expect Ruth to act like a Moabite woman. Yet, she never does. There is a contrast with the Israelite women of the period of the judges. Israelite women were constantly drawn into idolatry. But Ruth is drawn to God and behaves like a child of God. Her behavior as a child of God is borne out by her actions while obeying Naomi's command. Now, in the ESV it says, take a bath, change your clothes, put on ointment. What it's really saying is, take a bath, put on some perfume, put on a clean dress, and go down to the threshing floor. Well, you would almost think, oh, where are we going with this? She goes to the threshing floor and lays by Boaz's feet while he is sleeping. The expectation, I think, is that she might try and seduce Boaz to induce him to marriage. Instead, when he says, who are you? <laughs> she says, I'm Ruth, and you are the Redeemer. Boaz's declaration when he finds out it's her and that she wants to come to him for redemption, he affirms her character. In chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask for. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman or a woman of noble character. Significantly, Ruth's dedicated service to Naomi and her behavior among the people of Bethlehem have convinced them 
that she is a worthy woman. And Boaz is anxious to protect her and her reputation. So I want you to think. Remember, she asked Boaz to be the redeemer. And he said, I'll do it, but there's one closer than me to you. What if it were known <laughs> where Naomi, where Ruth was? What might get hurt in that process? The first redeemer might not take her and her reputation would be ruined because of having been at the, the floor. In fact, Boaz says, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he sends her away before anyone can see, for he can make out people. But he intends to carry it out because he gave six, six measures of barley to her as essentially the down payment on the dowry to marry her. Boaz and Ruth maintained their integrity even in tempting circumstances. By the way, if it was dangerous for her to go in another field, Ruth show, Boaz shows I'm different than the other men of Israel. So Ruth did not use immoral means to entrap Boaz. In fact, the way I would put it is sometimes in grief, we sometimes think it's okay because of what's happened to go around God's laws. But Ruth would not do that. Indeed, she is a worthy woman. And so, what we see is that Ruth overcame her grief and her widowhood by choosing God and choosing to suffer among his people. Ruth also overcame grief and widowhood by, through dedicated service to Naomi. And to Naomi, who was not easy, but was bitter. And Ruth overcame her grief and her widowhood by maintaining her integrity. It's interesting in the text because God blessed Ruth and Boaz immediately. And it says, the Lord gave her conception. Which makes me think that her, she was prevented from having children through Malon. <clears throat> What's interesting about that is that God had a higher purpose for her. And she had to go through some suffering to find out about it. And I also want you to think that Ruth, by doing all that she did for Naomi, and how she acted, and how she behaved, and dedicating herself to God, became a refresher and a redeemer for Naomi. In fact, the name Ruth means refresher. Notice what the women said in chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Then the women of Bethlehem said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may His name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more than seven sons, has given birth to him. There's no doubt that the death of, the ch of children and a spouse would be a devastating loss. In fact, I would say you probably would think I will never recover from this. That life will never be happy. But what we learn from Ruth is to maintain and strengthen our faith in God at a time of loss. We learn from Ruth that the way to overcome such loss is to dedicate ourselves in service to others. And we learn to maintain our integrity and do things the Lord's way. There's no way, I think, that Ruth and Naomi had any idea of how God would turn their loss into good and bless many other people through that loss. Ruth refreshed Naomi, and with God's help, she restored joy to Naomi's life. 
And through Ruth and Boaz, God carried out His plan to bring the Messiah into the world. Job was another person who had great loss, but had great gain after he went through the suffering. And Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you.